Hi everyone, my name is Leslie Tan. I'm from the National Youth Sports Institute. And today we are having this webinar so that we can all find out a little bit more about what we should like to study in the US and how to get there. And uh, when Bina and Mark, uh, Richmond, Bina from SSI and I and Sining were discussing uh, this webinar, said we wonder how many people would sign up uh, when we actually put it out into the public. Eventually about over 140 people signed up for today's session. So for technical reasons, we had to limit it to 100 folks. And uh, so what we're going to do today is that we're going to record the session and so that we can share it with others as well after today. So we're quite glad to have with us uh, Todd Brown, the Deputy Athletic Director for the University of Southern Utah. Uh, his expertise is in uh, NCAA compliance, especially uh, for international students. Uh, then we also have Alex Palmer, the head coach of the men's soccer team for Life University. And his soccer program is in the top five in the country. Also with us today is Arthur Lowe, and he is the father of Haley Lowe. And Haley recently secured for herself a full scholarship to a university in California. And Arthur will share a little bit later about the journey that he took to uh, help his daughter get the scholarship. And also with us today is George Dongmani. He's the managing director of the agency group, uh, LLC based in the US. His company uh, helps parents in the journey to secure a scholarship. So just to explain to everyone, the SSI and NYSI are here to organize this session from an educational point of view, to help everyone understand what's it like to go through the application process and what you have to prepare for, okay? So if you do require further support, um, that will require further sessions with uh, George and I'm, George will then take it from there and you will have your own arrangements with George, all right? So, Let's dive right in. May I invite Todd to just say a few words uh, to start the conversation going and his presentation. Um, Todd, over to you. Thank you, Leslie, and uh, good evening to everyone. I'm assuming it's evening where you're at. Uh, I think probably the most important thing with the information we've been given and the time frame with which uh, we've been given to discuss the thing I probably need to talk the most about right away is to make sure that everyone understands that your ability to play at the collegiate level is based upon how good of a student you are in the classroom. And if you don't take the time to focus in the classroom to get your studies in, to do well in really the core subjects, which they consider the core subjects to be math, your native language, science, and history, um, social studies, if you don't really focus in and do well on those types of courses, then you're going to struggle to find a place to play uh, college athletics at. Um, with that said, the NCAA, if you're going Division I or Division II in the NCAA, you really need to have specific accomplishments in terms of high school graduation and the degrees that you get. But let's see if I can share my screen here. So if on the presentation, if you could advance to my first slide, which shows the degrees from Singapore. If you really look at the things you need um, from Singapore, there are three types of degrees that you can actually be enrolled in or move forward with in order to be eligible at Division One or Division Two. Really, these are the acceptable forms of high school or proof of graduation. And the three options you have are as follows. And I think number one is probably, as I've been told, the more prominent one. And that's the Singapore Cambridge General Certificate of Education. Um, and that's at the ordinary or the O-level examinations. And if you go that route, what you need to do is present five O-level exams um, in five different subjects areas that we've talked about and make sure that you pass those. And that will allow you to get your graduation, meet the graduation requirement. Uh, the second one would be the H1 level, H2 or H3 Singapore Cambridge General Certificate, and then have advanced A-level examinations. And you must present two A-level exams in two different subjects in order to meet the high school graduation requirement. 
And then the third option is just the National University of Singapore and get their high school diploma. Um, if you look, this is probably more important down at the bottom is if you look at the not acceptable forms or proof of high school graduation, if any of you are currently enrolled in any of those, I strongly encourage you right now to find a way to get in one of the acceptable forms. And the reason that's important is if you don't do that, your ability to become eligible to participate in collegiate athletics at the division, the NCAA division one and division two level will be hampered. Meaning your first year in college, if you go to a division one or division two school, you will not be allowed to practice, compete or receive an athletic scholarship. You'll have to go to a four year school uh, for your first year on your own. There are different ways to get in, but the quickest, the easiest way to meet the high school graduation requirement and be eligible for division one or division two athletics is to be enrolled in one of those three programs of studies. If you look at this, this is how they come up with your GPA requirement. And in order to be eligible, you need to meet a GPA requirement and combine that with the test score. Uh, right now, because of the virus, for people that are entering college for the first time full time this year, they're actually waiving the test score requirement. But I fully anticipate that coming back in and being a requirement in years to come. So we need to look over, um, and that's, I think I saw a question just pop up, is an international baccalaureate degree acceptable? Yes, it is. Um, you have to look at meeting the criteria. They view that more as a kind of a standard US where you have to meet certain requirements um, and, and pass the levels. But yes, an international baccalaureate is acceptable. I can get that information sent out to George and he can have that accessible and provide that to people as a follow-up to this as well. But if you look over at the general certificates uh, in the numeric grade and how that equates over to the US grade point average, you really, the better student you are, the lower test scores you can have. The lower student scores you have, the better test score you have. It kind of correlates in your ability to meet the academic requirements to participate receive a scholarship in your first year at the division one or division two level. That's kind of the baseline minimum that you need to meet for academics. I believe there were some other questions that came up um, that I was prepared with to talk about. If you want to go to the next slide, we can talk a little bit about that. And I think this is specific to Singapore. Sorry, one more. And so the next thing that I think needs to be shared with this group is because I Correct me if I'm wrong, but there's a required military service uh, requirement for all individuals living in your country. And that tends to happen right after high school. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Usually happens, so there's usually happens at the age of 17, 18 or 19, depending on okay, the child's perfect. age. Well, so that does play into something that uh, you need to be aware of and need to track on. Because at the NCAA Division I level specifically, and I believe at the Division II level, once you graduate from high school or you earn that certificate, um, you can't delay that. That's also based on if you enter with a group of students based on when they feel you're, you start your high school career and you delay graduating from high school, they will basically look at the date you should have graduated as your graduation date. So you can't take a longer time to graduate and think that you can continue to improve your athletic ability. They really want you to stay on track to make sure that you graduate in the time that you should be graduating. And from there, depending on your sport, you either have six months or a year to go out and better yourself if you want to with your sport before you enroll in college. And if you don't, then you start losing eligibility at the division one and division two level. So there are some exceptions to that. And one of them is the military exception. And basically all the military exception will do is that once you enroll in the military, it kind of puts everything on pause. So if at 17, 18, 19, you are enrolling in your military service, the NCAA will allow your clock or your timeframes with which all these things happen to just pause for a minute. Um, and that's specifically what these rules are from the NCAA. Uh, they call them bylaws, but bylaw 12.8.1.2, the service exception to five-year rule, says that time spent in armed services and official religious missions or with the recognized foreign aid services of the US government is accepted from the application of the five-year rule. 
Among such services that qualify a student for an extension of the five-year rule are, and you can see right there the first, uh, those are some of the other ones that apply. So just know that you have that ability to go. Um, competition could be looked at a little bit differently while you're in that service agreement. Or, so just make sure that you're having open communication um, with the colleges that are recruiting you or looking at you in terms of what your goals are and what you are trying to accomplish. And they can guide you in terms of competition while in military service. That's a very brief overview of, I think, some important things you may need to know. I don't know if we open it up for questions now or if we wait till the end and then open up for questions, but that's, like I say, a very basic overview of where to start. Uh, the one part with that that I think would be important to know is if you are serious about going to the division one or division two or feel you want to, in order to become eligible, you do have to register with the NCAA eligibility center. There is a fee with that. It's somewhat pricey. I think it's climbing. It's 80 or $90 US dollars. Um, but I would only do that if you're serious about it. And I would do that in your last year of high school education. That would be the time I would encourage you to do that. Thank you, Todd. So we'll go on to ask um, some questions. And we have actually consolidated the questions from those that the uh, participants have come in with. Another frequent question, well, what was the actual cost involved? Uh, so what kind of scholarships are available and how much cost do this cover? Yeah, so... Oh. Uh, George, you have helped many athletes secure scholarships. So could you share some insights? Uh, it, I can. So it's scholarships are dependent upon sport at the Division I, Division II level. Uh, Division Three at the NCAA doesn't do any athletic scholarships, but they do academic scholarships. And then there are scholarships at, at the junior college level and at the NAIA level. So almost every school will give you an opportunity to get a scholarship. It depends on whether or not it's athletic related or whether it's academic related. Um, at the institution I work at, there is a significant amount of academic aid that is given to international students. So I think part of that is, is looking at what sports offer. There's very few sports that offer what they call full scholarships. And that means that I only have one op so many opportunities to give someone a scholarship. So I'm going to give them a full scholarship, which covers all aspects of what school costs. Most of the other sports are equivalency sports, where a coach has the opportunity to take a full number of scholarships and divide them up amongst many people. So you'll get partial scholarships. And in those situations, it's probably good to combine a partial scholarship athletic with a partial academic and get your schooling paid for. However, most coaches know that if they have an international student athlete that they're trying to go after, that the likelihood is they're going to have to divert, uh, put about a full scholarship together to try and get that individual to come and participate for them. So it all depends upon the level you're at, the availability of what they're allowed to do from an athletic standpoint, but also what the school will do from an academic standpoint. And costs can, can vary greatly. Um, if it's a state school, basically that the state government runs the school, the costs tend to be a little bit lower. If it's a private school, then the costs of schooling tend to be significantly higher because you're paying for those full costs. Where the state schools, the schooling is actually offset by the taxpayers of the state. And also, uh, Bina, I just want to echo um, from Todd, you know, basically he covered uh, many things already, which, um, you know, I can echo him. Um, you know, basically the causes all depend on um, the, the, the scholarship, athletic scholarship that um, they will receive. Um, as Todd said, you have full um, scholarship and also the partial scholarship, which is uh, all those sport uh, equivalents. So it depends on the sport that you play. Um, that the scholarship you will receive, but you can also combine with, between uh, athletic scholarship and also, um, you know, uh, academic scholarship and also grant. You can combine them all to your total uh, financial support. Right, Todd? That is correct. Yes. 
and, and also you know, <laughs> with the inflation, um, the NCAA registration now is 150. Dot. <laughs> they they keep increasing every year. <laughs> So yeah, so let 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 lead it up to my uh, my presentation a little bit. Just tell you a little bit uh, myself. But first of all, thank you, um, you know, SSI and NYSI to invite uh, me to be here. And of course, I, you know, I I, I just been through it um, from um, you know athlete itself um, perspective, and also the parents and also the advisor. Um, so I've been through all the whole process and. Um, you know, so just starting from that. Um, let me share you my uh, background a little bit. So this is uh, our company, the agency College Recruit. So um, basically, by myself, as I mentioned, I've been through this. I was uh, a national player, tennis player from Thailand 30 years ago, it's, uh, a while ago. Um, I went up as high as uh, 46, a junior in the world. And I thought I can turn professional, just like everybody gets on the call. And we have a professional, um, professional dreams. Um, so I, I, I dropped out from the school in Thailand and played hospital. Um, came here to U.S. and, you know, reality hit. It's a lot harder than I thought. Um, so we, you know, after a year, I figured out that, you know, maybe I want to keep my dream alive. And lo and behold, it's the U.S. Uh, system that you can get a degree, attend a college, and also um, keep pursuing your dream. So I went to um, UCF, uh, South, Fort, uh, South Alabama, played there for four years, and after that, I finished my MBA at George Washington um, and worked for Morgan Stanley about 25 years and, and, and starting my own company about eight years ago. So uh, with our company, um, basically, as I mentioned to you, I've been through the whole process. Um, I can come in as a, a parent standpoint of um, what you want to see and how you want to um, uh, create the pathway, but the sooner is better, is my recommendation. So the sooner you start the process, the better. And with your uh, Singaporean system, um, you actually graduate from high school um, you know, after you finish all levels. So, you know, between 16 and a half, 16, 17, you actually can come to college theory. So your process actually, you know, basically start earlier than other people around the world. Um, so, you know, and, and, and our company, it's about finding the right fit for your college. So if, you know, you need any help and need anything, just contact us and, and we can, can certainly can talk a little bit more detail later on. But to echo from uh, Dina uh, question regarding to uh, cost of attendance and um, and I saw uh, you know how many scholarships out there um, that you can uh, pursue. Um, so I want to step back a little bit because in US there's about 2,000, more than 2,000 colleges that have sports scholarship and they can divide into D1, D2, D3 and AIA and JCC and JCAA or, you know, it's also Canadian and the California one too. So it's about 2000 colleges. How do you know which one is the right, right one for you? That's why it's all depend on your perspective and depend on your uh, background and, and expectation of what you want um, to achieve in, in life. Um, you know, every year there's about, you know, more than 500,000 um, student athletes that received this scholarship, you know, in 24 sports. And, um, you know, it's a lot of money um, that they've been giving out from college standpoint um, to, to have a student athlete at that program. So, you know, the number is staggering 3.1 billion a year just for D1 and D2 alone. Um, and we can hear, we will hear more, um, you know, from um, Coach Alex regarding to NAA school or D3 or ju even junior college two-year program. That's a lot more money that they, they, you know, U.S. system has put out for a student athlete to be here. And Todd was mentioned about the full ride, the full scholarship. You know, for, for men, uh, if you play uh, basketball or American football, yes, in D1, it's a, a full ride, which is everybody who play on that team will get the full ride, which is including tuition fee, um, books, room and board, meal, um, you know, training, competitions, and everything. Um, but for the women, which is you have more opportunities, 
Um, if you play uh, a, a full sport like basketball, tennis, volleyball, gymnastics, you, you, know, you can get a, a full ride for that. But outside of those sports, outside of um, you know, uh, men's and women's basketball, football, um, they're all equivalency sport for D1. So what it means is, um, for example, uh, we, we, we have a lot of uh, golf parents here um, in the webinar today. Um, so in golf, uh, they, have, they normally carry about eight, for men, they, they normally can, uh, carry about eight or 10 uh, play on the team, but there's only uh, 4.5 full scholarship. So what it means is coach will be deciding who should get uh, a full ride. Uh, you know, somebody can get a 50%, somebody can get a 10% because they have only full part, uh, 4.5 scholarship to work on. So basically, you know, the, the thing that I hear the most from coaches is that if you are a, a game changer for that program, you will get a full ride, your possibility to get a full ride. But if you're not a game changer for them, you can play on the team, get some part of scholarship to support um, all those, you know, um, criteria that they have. So that's um, that's about it for D1 and D2, um, and also the D3. They don't uh, offer athletic scholarship, but they do have academic scholarship or a grant that sometimes you can combine them. That can be more than uh, a sports scholarship. It's all depends, but. As I mentioned to you, it's all important for parents and the student athletic standpoint. Um, you need to find the right fit for you, okay? And uh, the way I've been through this for 30 years is that um, there's about five pillars that you should be looking at it, right? First, academically, you know, what major you want to study, if that school have it or not, or if uh, what do you want to be in the future. Um, you have to look at it very, very seriously, the number one academic standpoint. And um, second is about sport, you know, if that school have a good program, they have a good uh, facility, they have a, a support system that will allow you to keep improving your sport ability while you're attending the college. And of course, socially, you know, what are they community look like? What are they gonna be? What are the uh, alumni system look like? After they graduate, maybe they have network for you to intern or um, you know, professional pathway for something else outside of sport. And, you know, a main thing, I'm from Thailand. Um, a lot of other um, athletes from Asia don't want to be, you know, in the cold weather. So they choose between the, you know, bottom half of U.S. Um, so they don't like to be, uh, you know, like uh, Denver. I'm sorry about that, but it, it's cold. And it's cold three or four months out of the year. And it's snow, you know, sometimes you get... Uh, six, seven inches uh, easily or, or, or more. Um, so it all depend. If you like the cold weather, you shoot cold weather school. Um, if you like warm weather, you, you choose another one. If you like humidity and the beaches, you go to Florida. So it's all depend on your preference. And of course, everything's come down to financial. What type of uh, support, financial support that you will receive from the college and how much you have to uh, you know, put up on your own uh, personal investment. Um, it's all dependent. All these five pillars will come down to choosing the right fit for you. Um, but, you know, as I say, uh, when you're starting this process, you want to have a big, big, um, large number of the school that you want to pursue. And then you start narrowing it down as you go through the process. So, yeah, there's a lot of money out there. And to answer the uh, Bina question, there's a, a lot of scholarship out there but there's still a pathway that you, you have to go through um, and the right way, um, it's, you know, for my example is that if you, if you drive down to something, you have a point uh, and you can't break down, you want to pay yourself or you'd like to have um, to help you to make sure your, your pathway is correct. So, Bina, I, uh, thanks again for, for inviting me to be here and I'm happy to help and answer any questions that uh, may have come from the, the webinar today. Hi, right, Todd. I think maybe you could elaborate on the points that Sylvia brought up. I think that would be quite useful for everyone. Um, for Todd or for me? I think Todd was answering the question in the chat. 
We've been oh. having a good chat conversation while you've been talking to George. <laughs> yeah, Todd was ignoring you, George. Oh, no, I was listening to everything George said. It was, <laughs> it was tying right in. It was just firing up some questions. But I think it's important for you guys to understand, too, that, that George is very good at what he does. Um, he's taken the time to, to really dive in and understand the U.S. systems. And it's, it's global. He's not just looking at one specific thing. He feels his job is to try and increase opportunities uh, for the, the people he wants to serve. And he's done a very good job of making sure he's done it in the right way, takes time to understand what he needs to do and the things he needs to help with. But through the chat, there's been some questions that have come up. And I think, um, as Leslie's noted, some things we probably need to briefly touch on. And one of those um, was from... Tivia, Tivia. Um, her question really became, she's concerned about the route that she's going academically and whether that's having an impact on things. And it depends on what level you want to participate in in your sport in the US system. But she talked about finishing her exams and that she's now enrolled in an art college. And depending on what that college looks like and how the NCA views it, it could technically be considered that she's already enrolled full time at a collegiate school which starts to have some impact on her ability to um, move. It starts her five-year clock. And what that means is once you enroll full-time in college after graduating from high school, that at the NCA level, you only have five years in able to compete four seasons. And so enrolling in an art college has the ability to start your five-year clock. So if you're really serious about participating, I would suggest you start looking um, and having communication with colleges and start to get your get evaluated what your, your standing looks like in terms of how many years you would have left on your clock and seasons of competition at the Division I level. Every level treats this under, it looks at it completely differently, but that's the Division I level rule. Division II, it's usually based on the number of full-time semesters of attended um, and division three is a different story altogether as is junior college and NAIA. So Alex could probably touch a little bit more on some of those, but understand that if once you graduate, the expectation from the NCA, the division one and division two levels is that the natural, natural progression is for you to get into college as quickly as you can. That's good. So your advice is, um, yeah, you need to really know where you want to go and then work, work through it. And you are saying that if you have like uh, started on a, uh, a course, which is like a polytechnic or like LaSalle art school and so on, that could possibly already start your five-year clock, right? That's correct. Yep. That's right. And At the division one level. And, and use some eligibility at the Division II level, and then each other level will have a, a variance on what that means for their level. Okay. So um, the, you also said the, the, the first, uh, first uh, starting point will be to start looking at universities, which you may want to target. So 20 to 30 universities. Uh, that you may want to target and as what uh, Josh has shared, we have to look at the things, uh, the five the five criteria and also um, um, whether or not the program suits you, the, 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 the weather suits you and so on. These are all important things to consider because you'll be there for a while. Okay, and uh, the registering in the N NCAA eligibility center will be one of the key steps as well. May I, may I get your understanding is that correct that will be one of the initial steps we need to take yes um, yes yes for and the good thing about that is they'll help you understand what not only the academic piece of whether you're eligible they'll also help you understand if attending another college or anything that you've done to that point has affected your eligibility in any way yes okay um, I, we also have invited Arthur today so I wanted to ask Arthur because he's a parent of a golfer who has successfully secured a full NCAA scholarship. So Arthur, if you're okay, could you share your journey from start to end in a, a five to ten minutes? Sure, sure. No, no issues. Um, basic, basically, I, uh, we actually started 
the journey five, six years um, before she was going to enter college. And um, to all the parents uh, here tonight, uh, my advice to you is to start, start them, start planning when they are in primary school, which is um, for the US, it's your grade six, before they take their PSLE exams. And that's where you plan your uh, route in secondary school because like like what's been said earlier there you can take the O level we have the IP the, and the IB route as well so you actually need to know uh, which route to take okay and it's also been said that the easiest route is actually the O levels route so that, that's how we we planned it okay and then um, one more point to note is um, if you are planning to go to the US, you really need to be good in your grades, okay? So it doesn't mean that you're going to go get into one of our elite schools, um, uh, will help you get into the US because uh, when you send, start applying to schools, you actually have to send your transcript, uh, your year nine or you, transcript, which is actually sec two, sec three, Okay, and um, knowing our education system, the um, secondary two and three exams are not easy, okay, comparatively to the O-level. So chances are that your grades, if you go to an elite school, you will not be having good grades. Um, this is from my experience with my daughter, Haley. She was from Raffles Girls School, one of the top schools in Singapore. Um, the grades were not very good. So when we compute down to NCAA, uh, the US standard of grading, the GPA, we only had 2.7, which was really low. But when she did her O levels, it was almost a perfect four. So that's the difference uh, uh, of what you need to understand. It doesn't mean uh, as a parent at primary six, I want to get my kid to a top school so that she can go to the top, uh, to a college in the US. Uh, it may not work to your advantage. Okay, you may see that Haley now, uh, she, we did transfer her midstream into Singapore Sports School because uh, being a golfer, um, she had to take a lot of time off to compete because every tournament is like four days. And uh, um, a lot of the tournaments are held overseas. So you may want to also consider the Singapore Sports School, which um, allows you to have a better balance in terms of your academic and your sporting training. Yeah. And um, when you get into like uh, 14, 15, that's where you actually start planning to go to the US. And um, I actually engaged George to assist us in navigating this route. Um, all of us want to get our kids into top schools. That is uh, the Singapore's mentality mindset. Um, when I first gave George my top 50 list of schools, um, after like a few months, uh, we realized that that is not a good fit for her. Okay. And um, we had, the school we actually decided on this California Baptist University uh, wasn't even in our first top 50 list. Okay, um, because we have to understand that uh, um, the Singapore system and the US system is a little bit different. Okay, here we go for academic excellence and all that. Yes, there they go for academic excellence too, but you need to understand that the kid needs to fit the school, needs to fit the coach, needs to fit the team. Okay, and um, one very important thing that... Uh, I've always been asked is, what about the safety? Yes, it's very important to do your own research too, that you want to go to a school which is uh, uh, in a safe location, safe location. You don't want to go to school which has a higher crime rate or anything. So all this you have to really take into consideration when you apply. Okay, and how did you get a... Uh, how, how did you get a full scholarship? What was the process that you took to get a full okay. scholarship? Arthur? Okay, that, that, that's a very interesting thing because um, we, from young, we sent her to attend a lot of uh, camps. 
and um, George actually organized uh, this college golf camps for different sports. So we attend the first one she attended was in secondary one. Okay. And that's where um, she actually wanted, decided that she wanted to pursue that because that's the first time she got to interact with uh, coaches from the universities. And then uh, she asked them questions and she trained with them for a few days. And that's where she felt that, hey, that's what, uh, this is something interesting. That's not something I get to do every day in Singapore. So that's where we started. And then when she liked, uh, or rather when she decided that she wanted to go there, she took the sport a little bit more seriously. Okay. And um, she actually trained harder and uh, because she has a goal to, to actually meet. And um, we actually sent her to the U.S. Uh, this is for golf. Okay. We actually sent her to U S to compete. And then she actually did very well in the U S and that's where she also got spotted by some of the coaches. Of course, this was all, uh, uh, assisted by George who arranged for some of the coaches to come and, uh, watch her play and all that. So this is how we actually, um, managed to secure the full scholarship to U S. Thanks Arthur. Yeah. Perhaps this is a good time now to bring in Alex Palmer. Alex is a head coach at, for football, or for soccer, as we call it, as they call it in the US, uh, at Live University. So Alex, maybe you could just bring us through uh, what the NAIA program is and how do you recruit for it? My name is Alex Palmer. I'm the, uh, the head men's soccer coach at Live University. Can everybody see my screen? I am originally from the Netherlands. Um, I uh, coached there at, uh, at the professional level. I managed at a professional level as well um, and was appointed head coach of Life University about um, three and a half years ago. So I'm going into my fourth season with uh, Life uh, University. Um, we are located in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, we have about 3,000 students and about 500 student athletes uh, of that. Uh, the degrees that we offer um, are quite fast, but mostly we are known for our doctor of chiropractic program, physical therapy, athletic training uh, program, and exercise science. Um, but most of my players also um, study business uh, management um, and uh, sports marketing. So we have 45 countries represented in our university. So it's a very international school here in Atlanta. We have a 16 to one student faculty ratio and the annual cost to attend Life University is about $24,000 a year. And that includes your tuition, your books, your housing, your meal plan, that's your total cost uh, of attendance. Um, I think Todd, George, everybody touched upon it a little bit. Um, the opportunities, you know, in America, the division one, the division two, II, division three, NIA and the JUCO or the junior college level, which is a two year program. Uh, our university is NIA. Um, we also have in the NIA um, a um, uh, eligibility center that you have to go through in order to become eligible to compete, to play. There is a cost associated with that uh, as well. So when you are uh, certain that you want to come compete the, in the NIA or at the NIA level, then um, you will have to go, every student athlete has to go through that eligibility center. The um, difference between the NIA and the NCAA, in short, is that the NIA does not have as many requirements or rules or regulations as the NCAA. So um, it's a little easier for me as a coach to recruit and talk to people, talk to parents, where the NCAA coaches have some dead periods where they are not allowed to have any communication with, uh, with the athletes. Uh, we as NIA coaches can, can talk uh, whenever we want, wherever we want, to any student athlete. Um, our conference, our soccer conference, it, we are a part of the Mid-South Conference. So in the United States, we are in Atlanta, Georgia, which is obviously the lower part, the lower state, uh, right above Florida. Um, but we have other universities in different uh, states as well that we compete against. So we travel to Ohio, Kentucky, and Tennessee to play uh, our games. So for the faraway games, we take the airplane. And uh, for the 
games within eight hours, we take uh, the school bus to go to uh, those games. Typically, we stay overnight uh, before a game. So all the hotel costs, the meal costs are covered by the university uh, when we are on the, uh, on the road. Um, we are, uh, last season, we were number 23 in the United States in terms of our ranking. Um, in America, you know, your results in any sports are very important. Um, our record was 13-5-1. and one. That made my boss really happy. We had 13 wins, five losses, and uh, one uh, tie. Uh, we were the regular season champions. Um, and we have a very international group of players. We have 38 players from 24 different countries on our roster. So um, it makes for, um, we call ourselves the United Nations. It makes for, for a very international group. Um, and we are, um, except from Oceania, uh, Australia, we have players from every other part uh, in the world on our roster represented. The regular season for our uh, team goes from August till uh, December. It's a fall season. We are a fall sport. Um, we start off with a non-conference schedule and then we go into our conference schedule followed by the conference tournament. And this is for most sports applicable. applicable. So, um, and then um, we go into the national tournament uh, if you qualify. So you have to qualify for your conference tournament. You have to qualify for um, the national tournament and that um, can be done through winning the conference championship. You qualify for the national tournament or winning the regular season in our conference because our conference is one of the strongest ones in the United States. Um, we also automatically get into the national tournament. And then the third option is if you are a nationally ranked, you can get an at-large bid into the national tournament as well. And then in spring season, we, we have um, approximately six to eight weeks of training and we play three to four scrimmages. In our case, uh, we are, um, our campus is right across uh, the training grounds of Atlanta United, the Major League Soccer Club. So each spring we play Atlanta United's uh, reserve group or their under 20 group, or in, in one case, we played a mix of their reserve and their first team. So for my guys, it is uh, quite an experience to play against uh, professional soccer players as well in the spring. We are allowed to do that um, and have these, uh, these types of games. We also then can cross in the spring with our scrimmages um, into the NCAA. So we play NCAA Division I uh, schools or Division II schools as well in the, uh, in the spring season. Um, these games don't count for anything. They're just friendly games. Um, but that's how our spring season uh, looks as well. Um, we sign our players, like I said, from all over the world. And how do we do that? Um, we Players send us videos. They send us information uh, about themselves. We have several agents that we as a university or me as a coach, we trust. George being one of them, uh, actually the only one that we work with in Asia uh, for our university, uh, his agency. So... Um, and those agencies, they send us uh, also videos or bios information or applications or um, they keep us or help the student athletes with their SAT or ACT uh, testing or TOEFL scores that we, that we need um, if you come from a non-English speaking country. Um, so it is important that you sign up with an agency. It really makes the process a lot easier coming into the university and for us to, uh, to sign you. Um, we also go to several showcases around the world. Um, George's agency has invited us to come to several countries in Asia to do camps, clinics, to work with athletes. So we get to see them, we get to talk to them and meet them and, and kind of um, see what level you are and see if you can be a good fit uh, for us. At our university, we have 12 full ride scholarships that we divide amongst 38 players. Some of the players get zero dollars. We call them walk-on players. Mostly they are United States uh, citizens um, that really wanna uh, play on a college team. And then we divide our money based on the talent level um, of the player that we see. We identify players uh, the following way. So when we look at a player, we call it the money ball system at our university. Um, we look at five components for each player. 
Uh, and I think a lot of sports or, or coaches, when we recruit, when we scout players, um, you know, you look at some form of technical ability, intelligence, speed, physical, and your mentality effort. So we give you a point uh, for each one of those categories, components, and then we can kind of gauge uh, the, um, the win percentage, your average um, score. And we know that if the team scores on average between 3.0 and 4.0, that our win percentage will roughly be about 700. Um, 500 is average, considered average in America. So you need to stay north of that. You need to do better than that as a program. Last year, our team GPA, uh, team average in terms of the performance from the players was 3.72, and our win percentage was 0.720. So it's right on top, right on par with um, where we do. So uh, we value the training session. So we evaluate the players each training session. Our st my staff and myself. And then in the games, we, we actually double that grade because your game performance is obviously the most important uh, performance that you have. So this is a system we developed here at Life University at the men's soccer program. It has been successful for us in terms of identifying players. So when we go to camps, when we go to clinics or when we go to showcases, we, when we look at players, we kind of take the emotion out of it and we kind of look at a player and really give you a grade on your performance. Um, typical training for us, um, we have 38 players. We have five, six coaches on my staff, including myself. Um, we divide the teams up, the group up in 16 to 18 players. Uh, each group works with two to three coaches. And then we work five days a week. So Monday through Friday, we train. Typically Saturday, Sunday, we're off. Um, and we have 24 weeks in the NIA that we're allowed to train throughout the year. The other weeks, the team is training with the strength and conditioning coach, and there's a separate schedule for that uh, as well. So, um, now, every country, including our country, we are dealing with COVID uh, right now. So um, a lot of individual training, uh, Zoom sessions we have done with our, our team while they were uh, not allowed to train. Um, it looks like uh, the NIA has made a decision to push training back to August 15th. So we are allowed to start August 15th with ball training and we can compete again September 5th here in uh, the United States. So um, we are looking forward to that. We were supposed to start August 3rd with training, um, but everything has been pushed back for two, uh, two weeks, which, which is okay. Um, the Zoom, I'll go over it. So. Any questions you might have, feel free to, uh, to ask them. Um, like George said, I also run an, an, an academy uh, here in, um, in Atlanta, a youth academy as well. Um, so we have had players from Asia participate uh, with us in the youth academy and then join us into the showcases here in America, um, you know, and, and being seen by college coaches that way. So there's a lot of opportunities for players to, um, to be seen, um, but like I said, the best way is um, to show us video or go through an agency like George's um, and, and work through that. That makes our, our uh, job also a little easier um, in terms of, um, because in, for example, in my university, I get 3000 emails a year from players who wanna play for me. So, um, and in some emails I get five, six, 10, 20 players an agency that sends me 20 players uh, that want to come play for my university. So it's very hard for me and my coaching staff to um, filter through all the emails, all the requests that we're getting. Um, you know, so when we work with an agency that we trust that can help us uh, identify, it makes makes life a little easier for us coaches. So. Thanks, Alex. I'd like to go back to a question that Yvonne Chan had brought up in the chat, which is uh, about taking A-levels. So if a student athlete takes the A-levels, finishes the O-levels and then goes on to take the A-levels, does that affect eligibility? Maybe George or Todd. That's, that's a great question. Um, and I don't know that I have the answer right away. I, I know in the English system that that does help them. Um, they just said she doesn't have any O-levels. So 
if she's just doing the A levels, then she's just got to focus on that number two on the slide that we came gave, which is just making sure she gets two of the A level exams passed in two different subject areas. And that's just to meet the graduation requirement. They'll still look at other aspects of what she's done academically to make sure that she's got sufficient math, sufficient native language um, and science. Um, can I answer this question? Because I have um, one kid actually went through this problem. Okay. Um, to answer Yvonne's question, uh, there is actually a trick to do it. Um, your daughter is probably in what we call the IP program. Um, so it's a six year true train without the O levels and it's true to A levels. You can actually take the ICGSE, which is the international version of the GCE O level, take it privately and with that, um, you can also gain admittance to a US university. Uh, and if she is uh, in Raffles Girls School, I don't know if she's in Raffles, um, they do recognize the Raffles four-year program as uh, equivalent to um, all levels. They, they do recognize that too. So yes, um, there is a way out for, for Singapore kids. We actually can take another exam, uh, which is actually open to uh, the other country kids. And also, I like to add that there's so I, I wouldn't say um, there's so many ways that you can uh, certify as a high school graduate in order to uh, compete here as an NCAA regulation. Um, so you know, as um, Arthur mentioned, um, ICGSE is a good way. IP, you know, O level, um, AS level. You don't have to take two year A level. You can take one year, uh, year eleven. You can still you know, considering as a high school grad. So many opportunity along the way, but you know, start planning early. That's the best way to do it. And have good communication. If there's a school that has strong interest in you, have good communication with their compliance department. They'll help you navigate what you need to navigate. They can have a direct line to the NCAA, look at your information, and really sort that out for you. So if there's real strong interest from a coach, and they want your son or daughter make sure that you have good communication with their compliance department at that school and they can help you really navigate the things you need to navigate. Maybe Todd, you can also make a comment about uh, Singaporean students or international students who come over with an O levels. Um, do they find it easy to transition into the American system with uh, Singapore with, by taking the O levels in Singapore? Um, I. I would think that anyone who's meeting the minimum graduation requirement is what the NCA has evaluated. It's going to do fine. They're not going to struggle. Um, it really comes down to the, the TOEFL is probably the biggest indicator and most institutions will look at that TOEFL for an admittance requirement. They really want to make sure that you're going to be successful based on the content that is going to be taught in English. Um, but O levels versus any one of those, if you're meeting a high school graduation requirement that the NCA feels is sufficient, that's what they're really trying to do is assess college preparedness. And can you be a successful student at the collegiate level? And so any three of those is going to lead to success as long as they've got the right TOEFL and, and have met the right high school graduation requirements. And also, I just want to uh, let you know that um, if, if you look through the, the pathway between um, you know, high school and, and, and college, uh, we talk about the minimum requirement, okay? But uh, we all, as parents, we want to have, you know, above average. And uh, if you, you know, decided to go to a level route, you want to make sure those classes have been credited to university as well. So that way, you know, rather than 120 requirement uh, credit, um, you know, you, you walk into university with some credit from A level, or that would help. And there's a question from Regina about trying to get the attention of a coach. Alex, you'd like to take that up? The question is, with so many emails, what would you suggest the athlete do in order to get some attention? Yeah, I mean, the, the one thing you don't want to do, let me tell you some things that you don't want to do. You don't want to um, send an email to 40 coaches at the same time. If I get an email like that, I delete it immediately. You cannot take the time to email me personally and 
um, you know, uh, not copy for the other universities, coaches' names in there. Um, so you want to make sure you BCC uh, the email or just send an email to me, you know, um, alone. The other thing is um, you want to take the time to spell my name correctly. When you address me as a coach, I get all kinds of weird names, uh, you know, they... So for me, that's also a sign that you're not really paying attention. So that you're sending out a standard uh, email uh, to me. Um, in terms of uh, the email, if you um, can put in the email, for, for example, in America, if I, if I recognize a name or, universe or school or uh, a country I've been to, it's a little easier for me to take an interest. If the email is written in good English, uh, that's a good indicator for me to see uh, that, you know, we're probably going to pass your TOEFL requirements for our university. So, uh, we look at that. Um, and then of course, is there a video link? Is there, do you have a highlight tape? Do you have um, an agent that you work with? In our case, um, we typically get emails from George, uh, his agency about players and, and potential players with good video. But uh, the video that you send, please make it very recognizable for us to watch because some of the videos we're getting, um, the player is not highlighted. So we don't even know who we're looking at uh, or the video is done by mom or dad on their phone and they're shaking all over the place. So after 10 seconds, I get dizzy uh, just watching the video. So um, it's important that, you know, you do all these things, um, but it is marketing yourself and it doesn't matter which university and, and which coach or which sport you have to market yourself. So um, I think um, the father already said that his daughter went to uh, camps, you know, um, that's starting, you know, when, when coaches start to recognize players and, and take an interest in players, um, that's how it, how it works. When you get that many student athletes that want to come play for your university, you really need to become top of mind of that coach, coach uh, his mind or her mind you know, to, to recruit you. Um, so persistence is also important. Don't shoot one email and then think that, um, you know, it's going to be okay. You need to be persistent and emailing us constantly. Uh, I think Todd and I already approached on it with the NCAA. There are certain dead periods in a season that the coaches cannot communicate to you. So don't be discouraged if you can't get a hold of a coach. Sometimes it's not because uh, the coach is not interested. It's simply because the coach cannot reach out to you, um, you know, or, or call you. Um, so these are all um, rules and, and, and uh, regulations that we as coaches have uh, set upon us by the NCAA or the NIA, um, you know, that we, we have to follow. So um, there, um, there are a lot of uh, girls, um, programs as well, uh, soccer programs in, uh, in the United States uh, because of Title IX, the, the, the rule that we have here. Um, and, and it's the same for our women's uh, coach um, as well here at, uh, at our university. So I hope that answered the question. Thanks, Alex. And there's a question about whether you coach female teams as well and whether there are female teams in your university, which I believe you do. Yeah, we do have a women's team. I coach females. I've, I've coached females at the NCAA Division One level. Uh, I switched over to the men's side uh, now in the NIA level. Um, but in my academy, I coach two female teams, um, U19 and a U17 team um, as well. So um, we also have women's. In fact, there are more uh, women's soccer programs in the United States than there are men's soccer programs. So um, again, because of the Title IX law that we have here in the United States, um, and most schools have on the men's side, American football and, and basketball as their main sports, um, you know, so there's more opportunity, I think, for females um, than there is for males. Uh, on, on the male side, you have to be a pretty special player for us to um, recruit you uh, because we just have an abundance of, uh, of choice and there's not a lot of, it's just, you know, the demand. Uh, in the marketplace, there's just not a lot of universities that offer uh, scholarships on the men's side compared to the women's side. Thanks, Alex. So it's 9.05. I think we should aim to finish in a couple of minutes. Um, 
If anyone has more questions you'd like to ask or put in the chat, uh, please do so. Um, in the meantime, maybe I could just uh, give maybe Todd a question about, you know, what are the success factors for international students adapting to the American college way of life that you've observed over the years? Ooh, I, you know, I think it's already been touched on. I think Arthur talked a lot about it with his experience with his daughter is it's finding the right fit. You've got to find it a, a place that you feel comfortable being at. And if you can get there and you have good support, then you're going to be fine. Um, most schools do have an international affairs department within their school where they help structure some of those things. But Arthur couldn't have said it any better. You know, he started out with a, a big list of schools that they wanted. And through working with George and different things, they were able to say, hey, maybe our list wasn't the right list. And they really ended up, I'm hoping, at a place that his daughter's finding success. And so it's, it really is going through that. If you're just there to play and you're just there to get a scholarship, sometimes that's not the best fit. Um, take the time to do the education. Make sure that you agree with the coach's philosophy. Make sure that you understand the teammate. Make sure that you understand the culture that you're getting to, because there's going to be culture shock. Um, we have a number of international student athletes that come here and it takes a little bit of time, but they adapt well. And it's find a place where you can feel welcome, but you can also engage yourself in the community. And the international student athletes that we have, I think have done a very good job of that. They, they embrace the community. They come here and they, they take it as a learning experience. And that's probably the greatest thing I could say is go there with the ability to learn and be open to the culture that you're immersing yourself in. Thanks, Todd. If anyone's interested in the journey that Arthur took with Haley, uh, we actually recorded a 20 minute uh, video separately with Arthur and Haley. And uh, my colleague Sealing will just put the YouTube link in the uh, chat the so you all can have a look at that. Sorry, Arthur. Hey, Leslie, I think um, we there are some questions from parents about national service for boys. Sure. How how is it going to impact? Uh, maybe can I just talk, touch on that for a minute? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, so um, for us Singapore boys, we have to serve two years of national service. Generally, we go in when we turn eighteen. So for parents, there is this scheme called the early enlistment scheme, where you can actually um, get your kid into the service, national service, when he's at 16 and a half. That's the minimum age. So um, do a bit of research on your own. It is possible. So uh, if you plan your route correctly for boys, after O levels, um, you can play a few months of competitive sports, go into national service, and by the time you graduate, get into college the same time as the rest of the world. You, it, it can be done. Okay, so um, the key is plan early. Okay, you don't want to go last minute and then you say, oh, I need this, I need that. So um, national service, it, it's not a big hurdle. There is a way out. So do a bit of research. Um, uh, it's all, what, what you can do, what you cannot do is all available on the internet. Uh, if you get any questions, or you can email me or email Sinning and I, I, I'm, I can help you answer those questions. Um, Leslie? Um, yes, George, well, go ahead. Here's the thing. I, I think we talk about um, all the items that are um, required by, uh, you know, NCAA or, or a coaching standpoint. And, and then also other share with um, the military uh, requirement, all the stuff. It's uh, sometimes, it's, you know, seem to be a lot. And a, a lot of stuff you have to do. Uh, but the thing is, you know, we, we help uh, clients, about 100, um, you know, clients uh, over the years and in, in all different sports. And I, I can truly tell you, each case of the family that we work with, they're all different. And um, it, it, you know, it takes some time and takes some understanding and to make sure you get into the right pathway and the right fit. You know, we work with uh, many swimmers. Uh, Sometimes the swimmer need to be here in the high school first before they have a chance to go to um, to the college, just like Joseph schooling, you know. And sometimes you can go directly from Singapore to college. It's all different, and especially soccer, like Alex, you know, the team sport. It's better to keep coming here to starting early 
to get exposure to coaches. So um, it, it seemed to be troublesome, but it's not. Um, you just have to be in the right pathway and um, you have to enjoy it. It's a recruiting process, it's about enjoyment. So the family and the kids, you know, it is, it is, you know, and, and I've been through it so many cases and they're all different. And at the end of the day, just like Arthur and congratulations from Kelly, you know, um, three year, four years of hard work. Now she see the, the, the end result. It's important to plan early. That, that, is, that is one thing I learned is um, you really have to plan early and you really have to do your homework, um, your groundwork on your own. And um, um, you can do it on your own, but uh, it's a lot easier if you, there are many consultants in the market, okay? So do due diligence, get someone to help you process it because um, all the coaches receive tens of emails a day and um, they really don't have time to run through everyone unless uh, your kid is a superstar. Okay, so um, you, need, you probably need someone to recommend you, to teach you how to do your resume, uh, like you say, uh, your videos and all that. So yeah, talk to your consultants, uh, whoever they may, may be to help you and do all that. Okay? It's not rocket science, but uh, it is a little bit complicated. Uh, okay, and um, sometimes it's uh, the expectations of parents also, because I'm from Singapore. I know um, a lot of parents here have got very, very high expectations of the kids because of our education system. But sometimes you have to understand it's not only um, the brand of the school, it's whether your kid can gain the most experience in the college. Okay, whether can she absorb the best experience in the college. No point you go to a brand name, big name school and then the kid suffers, the kid does not enjoy after six months, one year, wanting to come back and all that. I don't think any parent would want that. And it, it does actually happen. Uh, so make sure that you find the right fit for your kid. That's the best advice I can give to everyone. Thanks, Arthur. Are there any last questions that you need to get off your chest and get answered? Please do it now. I'm sure Todd, George, and Arthur will be more than happy to share with you uh, the experience. Last call, anybody? You know, um, with that, I, I, I just want to let you know if you need to contact me anything, please, I, I will give you my contact through, uh, you know, you, Leslie, and then Bina. Um, but, you know, my, my website is there, the agency college recruit. Uh, dot com. So um, anything that you like to talk about, you know, have any questions, just I'm, I'm here. So I've also shared the link uh, to the interview with Arthur and Haley. And if you'd like to know more about the journey they took, uh, please go to that link. I hope you'll find the information useful. And uh, George has um, made available a complimentary 30 minute uh, consult that you can arrange if you wish to find out a little bit more uh, as you embark on your journey to U.S. Uh, education. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, this is his uh, information. Yeah, so you can schedule a complimentary uh, consult. And again, as Arthur has mentioned, um, it, it's just informative information. So I um, just want everybody to enjoy the process. And when you look back, you say, all right, I, I, we done our work for, uh, you know, our um, daughter and, and, and son to have a, a good pathway and find the right fit here in the U.S. Okay. So thank you for attending today's webinar. Uh, thanks to Todd, Alex, and Arthur, and George. Thanks for taking the time to share with us. It's been a very useful session. And yes. what Thank we will you. do is uh, we will put out an edited version of this video and uh, put it online so that uh, if some of you can catch up on the content that was shared before uh, if you have missed some parts of it. Okay. So have a good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for attending again. And have yes, a good night. everyone have a good evening. Good night. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.